Hello, and good morning, everyone. My name is Kathy Hopkins, and I coordinate the webinars for Hausman Johnson Insurance. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, How to Write Job Descriptions and Why You Need Them, by Karen Bender. Today's webinar will run for the full hour. If there is time after the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with Karen. If you have a question during the webinar, feel free to type it into the question feature, and we will address it. After the webinar is over, there's going to be a short survey we are hoping you can fill out for us to give us feedback on the webinar and webinar topics you are interested in learning more about. Feel free to share your thoughts on LinkedIn or Facebook and tag Hosman Johnson Insurance. This webinar will be recorded and will be available on the webinar archive section of our website. Each attendee will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording and the presentation slides. This webinar is certified for HRCI and SHRM Continuing Education Credits, which we will show at the end of the webinar. I would now like to introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, Karen Bender. Karen joined Hausman Johnson Insurance in 2017 with over 30 years of human resources experience. Her experience includes regulatory compliance, such as FMLA, EEO, FLSA, HR and safety, benefits, wage and salary administration, employee relations, training, and payroll. The majority of her industry experience is in the insurance and manufacturing, and she is knowledgeable in both union and non-union environments. Karen also provides training services to the UW-Madison Small Business Development Center, SBDC, in HR areas and instructs the class for the UW-Madison Division of Continuing Studies. Further, she developed and teaches courses targeted at providing small businesses less than 100 employees with general HR guidance and employment law review to help them maintain compliance and improve their processes. Karen enjoys working outside, spending time with her family, reading, and traveling. She has traveled to 25 foreign countries so far, including hiking throughout Europe, a thousand mile snowmobile trip in Canada, and exploring the beaten path in China. We are happy and thankful that Karen can be with us today to share her expertise and answer our questions on job descriptions. Welcome, Karen. Thank you, Cassie. I'm happy to be with you here today. Um, so we will start on uh, and discuss today why should we have job descriptions and then how do you make them? Um, first of all, I'm not an attorney, I, and this should not be considered as legal advice. Um, there are a lot of things that enter into any employment decision, a lot of things to be considered, but if you um, have issues and have questions and concerns, it is worth the time, your time and money to spend um, the money getting an attorney and proceeding down the right direction. All of the advice today comes from uh, my experience, my research, and the training that I've had throughout my career. So if you need to consult an attorney, again, do so. It costs you a lot more in the long run if you don't. So why create job descriptions? I teach a couple of classes, as, as Cassie said, I teach a couple of classes at the UW. And when I talk to entrepreneurs and small business owners about creating job descriptions, I see many of them roll their eyes. They don't want to spend the time and the effort to do these. And it's very important that they be done and they be done correctly. First of all, why create them for the employees? they will better understand what is expected of them. If you can hire, hand somebody a job description during the interview process or prior to onboarding them, they are going to have a better understanding of what is expected of them than they would have otherwise. They'll, they'll better understand um, uh, what your expectations and how their skills match. And if there's expectations that you have that they are not able to do or not willing to do, they should know that before accepting the job. There is a Gallup poll, a recent Gallup poll showed that people 
employees, a high percentage of them, don't know what's expected of them. And that's because the employer is not communicating to them the expectations of the job. So sometimes employees fail or are disciplined for not doing their jobs when, in fact, the bottom line is they don't always understand the expectations and they don't always receive the training they need. If they are given a job description, they have the opportunity to tell you, you know what, I can't do this, but I'm willing to learn, or I, I need some training on this, and um, you'll know that in advance so that you can provide the training before it becomes an issue. So why, why do you want to create them for the company? What are the benefits for the company? It is invaluable assistance to you when, um, when, you're creating, when you create a job description you can fill it before you fill a job. It makes and or allows, depending on how you want to look at it, of the supervisor or the manager to give some real thought to uh, what they require in the position. I had a client one time with a, a startup tell me that he needed a cheese maker. It was a startup cheese factory. And I said, uh, no, you don't. And he said, yes, I do. And I said, well, let's think about this. Let's talk about the job description. I said, "For this is going to be the first employee hired. So if you, if you hire a cheese, you don't need a cheese maker. You need somebody who can run the equipment, do the quality tests, unload the milk, uh, do all the packaging, do the cleaning, and be able to train anybody that comes in, right? And he said, yeah. I said, that's not a cheesemaker. That's a production manager. So when we started talking about the actual skills that person needed and how much, he realized he didn't need a cheesemaker, just a cheesemaker. He needed somebody who could make cheese and do many other things. And when I've had worked with different leaders throughout my career, that's often been the case. When I start saying, what is your expectation? they start thinking about it differently. Many times our leaders or supervisors will have um, a ton of work to do and they will come to HR and they say they need some, you to hire somebody. All they know is that they have a ton of work but they haven't identified where the true shortages are and the tasks that need to be done by the new hire. So it will help if you can have that conversation It helps them think through that helps them think through the physical and mental demands of the job that they're thinking they need to fill. If you have a good job description, you can go from that job description and create relevant interview questions that will help you identify the specific skills for that role. If the tasks have not been identified, then you cannot, uh, you won't know the right questions to ask to get the right answers. It also, a job description is also invaluable when it comes to determining fair salary. What is, um, what is the right amount of money based, you know, to pay an individual based on these skills? I'm gonna show you a tool later on during this presentation that will also help you with that. Um, things with the current unemployment rate being so low you need to be sure that you're paying a fair salary so that you can reduce turnover and people aren't leaving you for a quarter, an hour, or for a dollar an hour, or whatever the amount is. You have to determine a fair salary to keep your employees. Bottom line, too, it is good legal defense for you. If you do your job description accurately and correctly, it should provide physical demands information for making return to work decisions. Uh, in cases where you have uh, somebody that's out for FMLA and is being released to return to work, if, if they are out for their own medical condition, you should be providing a return, to, a job description so they can do a return to work. Under the FMLA, if you are going to require a fitness for duty at the end of their medical leave, 
you have to provide that job description when you provide the designation form for them at the beginning of the leave. And you have to have that job description or physical demands form so the doctor can evaluate the job based on fact, not based on what the doctor tells you. Also for workers' comp, if you're going to be returning somebody to work or denying the return to work for a situation like that, you have to have that information. This also, the legal defense also comes in from the other, from the employment side for fair pay and equal rights. If you have done a good job with your job descriptions and then costed them out, you will have more defense, a legal defense for your decisions. So my ground rules, this is how um, I do it when I'm doing job descriptions. I don't treat my job description as the job ad or posting. My job descriptions will be, you know, depending on the job, some hourly um, positions, they'll be a page long. But some leadership positions, they'll be three to five pages long because the, the more difficult the skills and the abilities and tasks, the longer the job description becomes. But when I write the job description, and you'll see an example of one that I'm um, that we'll be showing, you can see there's a lot of information in there that the person who's taking the job will need. However, at the point of recruiting, I don't put that much detail in it because nobody's going to read that. I put in just the highlight of the tasks that are needed and some other key issues and try and entice the person to apply and hit the, the major requirements, but not all the details in the ad. There's, like I say, there's much more information in the job description. Um, you will want in your job posting also to talk about your why. Why do you exist? How are you going to entice those people to, to apply to work for you? Are you going to be a quality producer? Are you a fun, workplace? Are you making a difference in the world? All of those kinds of things you put into a recruiting ad to entice people to work for you, but they don't go into your job descriptions because it, it's, that is a different, um, different uh, animal that, you know, it just doesn't go in your job description because the job description can be a legal document. The reason for enticing the applicants might be the same regardless of the job, and it doesn't need to be in the job application. I, and I always uh, had other people involved in writing and or approving the job descriptions to make sure they were accurate. If the position didn't report to me, I needed to get somebody else's buy-in to make sure we had a very good understanding of what we were recruiting for and what the uh, and the accuracy of the job description. For example, you don't want to say that their job will require um, lifting 20 pounds on a regular basis when it's actually 40 pounds on a regular basis. You know, you have to be accurate. Another good practice is to list everybody that worked at, on the job description at the foot of, of the the last page possibly. You can put it wherever you want, but it's a good idea to just list them. Then if there's ever any questions as to why did we do this or why did we put this item in here, you can go to the list at the end of the job description and say, these were the people who were involved. Let's go back and talk to them as to um, what happened or why we put something in there or what has changed. So, Let's assume that you currently don't have any job descriptions or you and your boss don't agree on their value. So now what? Or you finally agree that they, they are important and so now you have to figure out how do you begin. It is a daunting task if you don't have some place to start and a plan to do them because otherwise they do take time to do right they do take time to do well, and you're going to have to figure out and prioritize how you want to do that. That's going to be your decision. 
do you go the highest to lowest, like the highest in the company on the org chart down to the lowest, or do you do it the opposite way? You start with the easiest job to do, which is what I would recommend if you have not done them already. Start with the easiest, get a few under your belt, and you'll feel like you're making progress. Or if you're not going to make a plan to do all of them at one time, take current openings or highest turnover positions and look at those, create a job description for those, and then build as you have openings and different issues and you have time. So let's talk about what goes into a job description. This is what I would include, and I know it looks overwhelming. Clearly, the title. Uh, when you use a title, do not use uh, a flash in the pan title. Don't use sanitation engineer for janitor. Don't use fancy names. Use names that people, if they're searching for a job, will find on, uh, on a Google search. So use a pretty standard one that people will be able to search that title. Then who do they report to? So if it's a mechanic that you're hiring for, then they report and they report to the plant engineer, that's who they report to. Use the title, not the names. Because the names of the people will change, but the title is unlikely to change. Again, do they, and do they provide supervision to anybody? Again, have titles if they do provide supervision. Whether or not you put exempt or non-exempt status on the job description, that's up to you. I think it's a good idea. Others say they don't want to do it. I think it's a good idea so that somebody looking at a job description knows right off the bat whether or not it's an hourly position or a salaried position, but that's up to you as to whether or not you want to include that. Then I do a highlight, a short summary of why the job exists. Why, are, why have we created this job description? And that is also what I would use in the job ad because then somebody can look at the purpose of the position and see a summary of why it exists and see whether or not it applies to them. Then I go into the itemized tasks and that's where you will spend a, the majority of your time. That I also talk about soft skills um, and We'll go through an example of that. Physical environment, physical demands. Are they working outside um, with black, with asphalt in 100 degree temperatures? Are they working in a freezer unit? Are they working in an office? Put that kind of stuff in there so that they know going in what kind of environment they're working in. What type, what hours of work approximately are they working? Do not state eight to four, Monday through Friday. That, that is, unless you state typically or normal schedule would be eight to four. I would stay away from that because if you state eight to four, Monday through Friday, and you require overtime someday, they're going to point that out to you if they don't want to work. So you could say normal office hours are blank. There are some flexibility and overtime may be required, but don't lock yourself into the hours of, of work. Um, if they typically work a 50-hour week and that's expected and required, make sure you tell them. Uh, the location, are they going to be traveling? Are they going to be working from home? Are they going to be um, required to be in clients' offices, or are they going to always work in the same location? And again, if there's some flex if flexibility is required, state that. State the education and or prior experience needed. Do not require a high school diploma for unskilled labor positions. I've had people tell me that they want a high school diploma, and I said, why? And they said, to prove that they can, you know, that they finished something. Well, a high school diploma has no bearing or indication that that is, is going to make somebody um, a better widget maker or packer. If you are not, if that degree is not required in order to be able to do the job, state that it's preferred an education or 
the prior experience is preferred if not required. If you're hiring for an engineer and if a higher if a a degree is required, which it is for many engineering positions, then you can state that. But if a high school diploma isn't needed or a four year degree isn't needed, don't require it. What you're also doing by requiring something that isn't really necessary is you're limiting your pool. You're, you're limiting the, the pool of applicants that can apply because if you state a four-year degree is required and somebody's got three and a half years, uh, then you, you, you actually cannot hire them um, without re-advertising the position to allow other people without a four-year degree to also apply. Yeah, are they are you going to um, are they going to be supervised and you, you know if the supervision is provided then state who it's being provided by um, whether or not travel is required and how much 10% local 50% international however that works state that on there and then have a signature block and we'll talk about the signature block a little more so Here's a short summary purpose example for you to read through on an HR generalist. Let's assume you were hiring an HR generalist. They're responsible, we highlight what they're responsible for, performing HR related duties, supporting designated business units, carrying out responsibilities in these functional areas, and then you list them. That is a very high level overview of the HR generalist position. So if you talk about tasks, when you talk about tasks, which right at, would be typically right after the purpose, then start with, decide how you want to do this. Do you want to start with the most important tasks and then go down the list? Or do you want to take the, the tasks that require the greatest majority of time, even though they may not be the most important. There are tasks in every job that are more important than other tasks. Some might be incidental, but they're still required to be done. You can add percentages if you see value in that. They take a great deal of time, but for some organizations, it's worth the time. If you say that an HR generalist is responsible for processing an, um, new hire, or let's say new hire orientation, and that's 30% of the time, then you can put, you can uh, add the percentages. But that gets to be very difficult. And if it's, if this is the first time that you're taking a run at job descriptions, that's adding a layer of complexity you may not need or that you may be able to go back and complete later, but it is very unlikely, unless you're doing your own job description, that you are going to know the percentage of time that a, that a position takes. Always add, at the end of your tasks, perform other duties as assigned. That means that you can tell them, yes, you do need to do this when I've asked you to do that. Um, and, and you want to have that catch-all in there. Tip just the highlights of the task. It's not a procedure manual. If you're, and I think and I have a, an example of the difference between a task um, and a procedure manual on the next slide. The tasks tell the employee what they need to do and the procedures tell them how. So here's an example. If you're, um, this could be for a, a, a number of different people, probably the payroll clerk. So your task that would be on the job description would be review and approve timesheets for biweekly payroll. Okay, that's an overview. That's the task. I've seen people try and put their procedures into their job descriptions and they don't belong there. In this case, here's the procedure. Log into ADP, click on messages, follow this time off, click on this, click on that, individually review. That's a procedure that does not belong in the job description. You, these procedures are a great idea and they are great for passing on knowledge and training and um, re, a great reference for somebody that has to learn a position 
but they don't belong in the job description. Just the highlight of the task, not the procedure. The signature block example is a, um, is a recommendation that I would make also. This states that the employee or the applicant, however you want to do that, has read the job duties and the requirements. They acknowledge they have the skills and abilities to perform the job. Uh, last year I had was hiring for a client and somebody signed all of these things and then came forward about a month after she started saying she couldn't do them um, and it was in direct violation of what she had signed that she could do. So we had, it was a complicated issue, but the fact that we had a form from her stating that she could do it helped us resolve that issue um, for the company because she, she knew she couldn't do the tasks when she took the job, but she hid that from us until she'd been in there for about a month. Um, it was sloppy, uncomfortable, but we were able to succeed in, in pulling her out of the job because she was not able to do it. So um, I state also that it is not inclusive and it can be expanded and it can be rewritten if we, if management deems necessary. So it is a kind of a safe harbor for you in, in some cases for doing that. I have seen some companies will give a job description at the interview stage, some companies will give it at the job offer stage, and some companies do it when the new person starts and the supervisor sits down and reviews it with them. I think that, um, that the person should have access to that job description and then before they accept the position and then sit down with the supervisor on their first or second day or sometime during that first week and review it so that their expectations are further um, defined. I want to go to, uh, we talked about some of the basics of what should go into them. This ownetcenter.org, and Cassie's going to take us there, is a great place for you to start. This is free. It's the former Government Bureau of Labor Statistics um, website where you can access everything. So if you click on ownetcenter.org and then go to that center column where uh, Cassie is, go, there is a lot of information for, on this website. However, if you want just the job description, click on ONET online. And then we're going to type, there's a lot of different places that you can look, you know, find occupations, all kinds of different things. But I always just go right up to the occupation quick search where Cassie is, and let's say a customer service rep. Let's type that in there and just go. So there you go quick search for customer service rep, you will get a list of, of topics or job titles that match your search. And so then you can go through these and say, oh, and they will be in order of percentage of match. So for example, customer service rep is going to be a high percentage match to the title you're looking for. But as you go down that list, it'll be less of a match, but they might still have um, tasks in there that relate to customer service rep. So let's click on customer service rep. Once you get in there, it is going to give you uh, the summary of a ton of detail. Where it says view report and summary, you will see a lot of of things that are underneath there, that it starts to attack technology, all of that kind of stuff. There is a ton of information there about customer service rep. Let's look at tasks. Right under tasks, there's a plus arrow because it says five of 15 displayed. If you want to click on that, it shows all 15. So if you need to write a job description, and there's thousands in here, you can go here and start, and you can say, oh, 
well, seven of these match, but I'm going to take these seven and I'm going to go, oh, we have some payroll duties. So then I'm going to go to the payroll portion and, or we have different other, other duties. They have to also have a receptionist. Then you can go to the receptionist one and put all of these together. There's a ton of stuff available in here. Many times, if you look at the skills, I was talking about soft skills earlier. If you click on those, this tells you some of the skills that when I talk about soft skills, soft skills, these are some that are listed. These may not all apply to you. Use this as an example, not as your end all without reading it and going through it. You may not want to list 10 skills. You may not, well, then you get into abilities, and there's 11 of them there. So you decide how much you want to do and what's important for your organization, and you can just keep going down all these different areas. Then it also gives you a piece about um, the education, high school diploma or equivalent. There's, and then you can, it talks about when there's an arrow there, it talk, gives you more detail. But here's something that if you, if you keep going down, there's more information, interests, style, related occupation. So now if you have a bill collecting portion of your customer service rep, you can click on that one and it'll take you there. But here's another important piece. Wage and employment trends, median wage for the state. So click on local salary info, type in Wisconsin or wherever you're located, and it will pull up for you wage information. This one is comparing Wisconsin to the U.S. And so you can see the difference, low, medium, and high for the wages. And of course, you'll have to do some manipulating. This is for the whole state of Wisconsin. In some cases, you can get it to be more narrow than that. For example, like you can narrow into um, like Madison, Wisconsin, or something like that, and, and you'll get more specific information. But here is at least a guide. Now remember, if they're pulling from all of Wisconsin, they're pulling from Milwaukee and Madison, which are gonna be higher than the, you know, Wausau and, and other cities. But it's a place for you to start. Okay, and then if you want to, um, it says the median wages on there is, is 2018. When you look at, and it gives you the hourly, you know, median wage, which means that, um, the majority, the more employees were at 1623 than at other areas, or they, they're, I'm sorry, median is the average. So that's the average wage for the state of Wisconsin without any consideration though for cost of living in the area they're in. But pay attention to this median wage and the year that's behind it. In some cases, if they have not received enough information to update this or haven't done this one for two or three years, you're going to see an older um, year in there. If this says 2016 or 2017, you're going to have to age the data because it will not have kept up with inflation, with um, wage increases, et cetera. So there is, used to be, on this site, a place where, um, where you could create your own job descriptions and just pull this information out and create your own job descriptions. I can't find that since they redid the site, but it is very easy for you to just copy. Just, you know, just copy it and dump it into a Word document and, and use it like that. So if somebody wants a place to start, this is a place to start, and then you just have to pare it down to what you need. It would be very unlikely for any of us to be able to, to need all 20 of those categories in the amount of, de of detail they're in. I pare them down. Okay, so we'll get back out of there. Again, that is free, and you now have the, content, the information for that. So, 
beware when of unconscious bias. You were hearing a lot about that in the news and everything else lately, but beware of your unconscious bias or supervisors or other employees unconscious bias when you start creating a job description or creating job ads. I still see, and we probably all have seen this, we want a recent college graduate. We want a fresh face. We want young and energetic or male applicants preferred or female applicants preferred. That's unconscious bias, and you cannot be putting that kind of stuff in your job ads or in your job description. So, and again, requiring a degree when one is not truly needed to be successful could be an unconscious bias on your part also. So, when do you create or update new job descriptions? You create when there's a new job being created in the organization. Maybe you're growing. Maybe you need to, um, maybe somebody's left and you need to reconfigure a department. And you're going to start a new job. Let's spend some time figuring out the tasks and the duties of that person. Update your job descriptions when there are changes. But if, if the job essentially remains the same, but there's just changes to the job, you'll want to update that so anybody going into that job or anybody performing that job now knows what the new uh, requirements are. When should you review it with the employee? I think it, upon hire. Some companies do it annually at performance review time. Some people only do it when their job duties substantially change or whenever the information on the form is changed. You need to decide what would be appropriate in the process for you. So I always did tell people, use a standard format. That, but that's my style. I mean, that's going to, um, using a standard format will allow everybody, once they're used to your format, to be able to go to say, okay, where do I look for this? Where do I look for that? And it's going to be so much easier for people who have a standard format to fill out a form and help you with creating these job descriptions if you have a standard format and they know what you're looking for. Again, indicate who was involved in, in writing the JD at the bottom. And I strongly encourage a sign-off section, but I still see a job I still see job descriptions from the clients where they don't have that. I always encourage them to consider that. And another, uh, to, but that again, that's your decision. But it helps to have it in their in their file that they signed that they knew something was their job duty, so that if you have a conversation with them, they don't say, "I didn't know I was supposed to do that." Um, because you'd have the conversation with them. And I like to send them no later than with the job offer letter if it hasn't already been done. And I ask them to sign it and return it. So as I said, there's um, different resources for creating these job descriptions, onetcenter.org. HR 360 has job descriptions in it that are also a place where you can start if you have your benefits with us, you probably have access to HR 360 for, uh, as, a free, um, as, a, as a free resource for you. There's always SHRM, the national SHRM.org. Membership is required to have access to those job descriptions. I have mixed feelings about the quality of those. People will um, log in, or many companies can just uh, send theirs into SHRM to be added to that library of job descriptions. If you look at them, they're, um, they're a place to start in some cases, but in, in many cases, they are not as complete as I would like. Again, my, my opinion, but it's another resource to help you get started. If you need more information about um, uh, unconscious bias and how to remove that from your job ads if you just want to make sure that you're not doing anything wrong or that your other leaders aren't doing anything wrong there's a good ad or a good link there for just removing bias for you to use 
So I am one at this time, before we go into questions, we're going to pull up a job description that I, that I wrote is, and it's the um, assistance office um, and HR manager job description. So if you go to the full, the top, you can see this, this is a very easy form to create and have um, a standard format for that. They, who the position reports to, when the position or when the job description was created, um, and then if you want to say created November 2017, reviewed January 2019, you can have that in there. Status, full-time, you could put full-time exempt. So for this position, I listed uh, in the, the primary position, we summarized the reason the job exists. We talked about um, the, the variety of jobs that were going to be required. This person had to have accounting, customer service, HR, um, background, and technical technology skills. So in order to do this job, somebody, you know, looking at the office manager and then they can see it, oh, I have no, I can manage the office, but I don't have any accounting, customer service, or HR skills, they wouldn't go any further in the job ad if, um, if, if the primary purpose they could see, or they shouldn't go any further, we all know that they still, many people still apply for things they're not qualified for. But some people will look at that and say, well, I don't have those skills. I'm not going to apply. Or better yet, I have all of those skills. I'm going to apply for this position. So I do the primary purpose. And then I broke this one down into primary responsibilities or tasks. You can call it however you want. Then I broke them down into the assistant office manager tasks. I broke them down into HR. And I broke them down into different categories so that they would be able to break that down. Now, we spent quite a bit of time highlighting the duties that were required here. This person was going to recruit and hire. They're in their HR responsibilities. They were to do benefits admin. They're going to do payroll. Now, this is a company, this one I wrote, was a company of about 35 to 40 employees. So this isn't unrealistic. But in uh, some companies, if you have an office manager, you're not going to have all these other responsibilities because of what the, the office manager position alone would require. Again, at the bottom, it says perform other duties as assigned. Then I went into additional responsibilities, um, saying that there, this was a unique position. And so we needed to really focus on process improvements and so different issues that would arise in the facility, um, you know, working in this case, like providing samples to vendors who are considering doing business with them or something like that. How can we improve the process for getting these samples to potential bidders? And so they'd be, in, you know, process improvements was a big deal. Process improvements is mentioned several times in this job description. So somebody knows that, that they need to have the mindset of continuous improvement. So then we talked about their qualification. You can state that regular attendance is required. There was a recent ADA deci court decision saying that we, you could do this. And there are many of us who struggle with attendance issues with our employees. And you can make a regular attendance as an essential function. I also state in there that reasonable accommodations will be made if, if, you know, in order to perform the essential functions, you should state that. And you should also, you should state in your employee handbook and in different places that if employees need reasonable accommodations, that they need to come have a discussion with you. So then we talk about other qualifications, three years of experience. We felt that was necessary in order for them to be able to come in to be able to do that job. It was not our intent to take somebody with no experience and teach them from the ground up. We had to have strong knowledge of employment-related laws. So you can see through there that we spent time identifying the skills that were needed and maybe some of this um, came from 
ownetcenter.org. More than likely, that's where I started with it. But then the rest of it came from having a conversation with the client and just asking questions. We talked about the work environment. I, majority is going to be in the office environment, some exposure to manufacturing. Noise level is usually conversational, minimal equipment noise. So those are the kinds of things that we would cover so that people know that. Physical demands were just, as, um, again, I made the statement about reasonable accommodation. They're regularly, but because it was an office manager, regularly um, required to use hands to finger handle or touch objects. They occasionally have to lift 25 pounds. Et cetera, et cetera. I always have certifications and licenses on mine. This person wasn't required to have any, but I still leave it on in the template. Supervisory responsibility, they're supervising the admin staff. And um, travel was minimal. And then there's my um, statement. I also have the employee sign, the supervisor sign, and in this case, the owner sign. And then I created the, the JD was written by me and approved by, and then I left the individual's name off of here, for example. So that's an example of a template that um, I find to be complete and thorough and, and cover all the bases of things that, that should be discussed. And then if you need them for legal defense, you have them. In a position, where somebody's working in a factory or working on the road or in construction or any, you know, even in the warehouse, a lot of those positions are going to require more analysis of the physical demands than I put on here. You can include those physical demands in here in much more detail, or you can use a separate form and create the physical demands because that is what um, you're going to need in order to uh, make a determination as to whether or not somebody or the doctor is going to need in order to make a determination as to whether or not they, uh, the employee can be released to return to work. Uh, so that is the end of my presentation. What questions do you have? And remember to put your question in the question feature so that we can see it and we will answer it. I'll give us a couple of seconds for you to type your question. Okay, so our first question is, what are your thoughts on including language in the requirements of, quote, or equivalent combination of education and experience? I think that's a very good idea. The, um, when you are talking about education or, exper or experience, a combination of the two of those is a very good idea. I, I have worked with a number of people over the years who have come up through the ranks. They maybe started as an hourly employee and have moved up through the ranks and become supervisors, leaders, managers. And, you know, they have hands-on, good, solid knowledge, but they might not have the education. They definitely should be considered for positions because they have the equivalent experience. So well, follow-up to that is how do you measure it and apply it consistently? That's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. The amount, you can't, um, because somebody could have um, 20 years as an HR manager and they do the same thing every year. Somebody else could have 20 years as an HR manager and every year the job changes because they build something. They build job descriptions and then the next year they build a training program and then the next year they build something else. So you can't put a blanket statement on how to measure and apply it. You have to, a lot of that's going to be just a conversation with the employee as to um, how did you, you know, what, what their experience is. If somebody goes into a job and for 20 years does the same thing and doesn't build on it and improve on it, 
that's a whole lot different than somebody who's demonstrated the initiative to really grab that job and build it. Next question is, how do you handle a situation where duties are added to the description that the employee can't or doesn't want to do? Oh, yikes. <laughs> if the employee does not want to do tasks that are added to the job description, that's a discipline issue or, or a discussion issue at the very least. If that employee if you need the employee to do those tasks and they don't want to do it, they may no longer be a good fit for the position. However, if there it makes sense, if their reasons for not wanting to do them, let's say based on their job load already or based on the fact that somebody else would be better um, equipped to do that, listen to their reasons for not wanting to do it. What we occasionally run into is that when new technology comes out, sometimes people are resistant to using the new technology. Let's use uh, Epic technology in a hospital setting. If they are unwilling to do that, it is a key part of their job and I don't know how they can continue to work, do their position as currently defined if they're not willing to learn the technology. So that would be something that if they're unwilling to do it, then it, you know they may not be able to do the job anymore. If they're unable to do it, then you still have a situation where if this is a business necessity, you're going to have to determine what's the best route. Do we change the job description again? Do we reassign those tasks? Or do we reassign the individual and find somebody who can do them? But there's not a blanket answer for how you handle somebody being unwilling or unable to handle new tasks added to their job. The government does recognize, and I'm thinking of lawsuit issues, that, the, that things change and people can't continue to do things the way they always did them just because that's the way we always did them. And they do recognize that people have to keep up with, with technology and somebody refusing to do that may not be able to be um, the one who is the right person for the job. All right, another question. If you put tasks in the job description that are learned OTJ, is it reasonable to ask the new employee to sign the job description? Good question. Um, I would, yes, if, because what you can do on the job description is say um, ability to learn. For, or, for example, you could require certain tasks and then other tasks would say, could say ability to learn. In some cases, there are, and I, there, there's another question on this coming up. Let's say that you have um, seven uh, customer service reps, but there's 10 distinct tasks that need to be performed in the customer service department. What happens sometimes is that you can have the, you can have all seven of these employees have the job title of customer service rep, but they may learn key portions of that. So let's say that somebody could be um, major account, somebody else's minor account, somebody's special account. So let's say that you have 10 different tasks or breakdowns like that. You could have um, one of the reps or three of the reps say major accounts, four of the reps do something else but that you could state in the job description that the reps have to have the ability to learn three of the following 10 um, tasks. That then between all of the reps, they've got them all covered. I hope that makes sense, the way that I explain that. So they still all have the customer service title, but they just have different areas of specialty. And so maybe after they've, um, and, and then you as the manager have to say, well, I don't have this area covered. This rep has got to learn this or, to, you know, we need to determine as a company how many people need to have this skill, but they all have the same job title. So um, is it reasonable to, to say, yeah, it would be reasonable to say 
um, to ask that they sign the job description as long as there's discussion between the employee or the applicant and the supervisor that I don't have that skill now, but because I've done this and this and this in the past, I feel I have the ability. Very good question. Yes. All right. So should you hire an employee who can do some but not all of the job requirements, when do you create a different job description? I think with the current low unemployment rate, many clients, many companies, many employers are faced with that decision. We have an applicant that doesn't have all of these skills, but they've got the right attitude. Or we have an applicant that doesn't have all these skills, but this is probably still the best applicant. And I think there's a lot of decisions made that are saying, yeah, they don't have all the skills. And that is not unusual. No matter who you're hiring, your process, your culture, your way of doing things is going to be different than anybody else's. And you'll have to accept people that are going to still require some training in that area. So, um, yeah, I think it's, it's absolutely fine to be able to, to do that. As far as when do you rewrite a job description, I've had uh, employers ask me to write a job description because they have a long-term employee that they want to keep and they want to design a job specifically for them because they are adding value, but it's a, they now need to fill a different role. I've also had employers say that they want to um, hire somebody and they have to write a job description because the person can't do all of the tasks. You have to be sure that when you are writing a job description, it is meeting the needs of the business. It can't just meet the needs of the individual. You, you can't keep rewriting job descriptions and for the needs of the individual and not also pay attention to the needs of the company. So as far as rewriting one, do you want to um, think about whether or not the job description will continue to live after that person leaves the company? So after that person, you know, if we write a job description that meets the needs of the company and that person leaves, is it still the right job description? Are they still doing the right tasks? So it's, again, kind of an individual decision. There may be times when somebody has a unique set of skills that you want to retain for a while, and you write a job description for them to be able to work with those skills. And there's other times where you're going to have to think, like, isn't, it isn't meeting the needs of the company to make those changes, um, and we need to change the job description. I think we have time for one last question. Okay. So is it better to have job descriptions that are very vague and broadly written, but you don't have to have so many, or should they be more specific? That's going to, again, be a individual business decision. They, they should be, I would think, a little bit more specific. Um, they, because you... Specific enough to the point where then somebody coming into the position or somebody in your company bidding into the position has an understanding of what is expected. If they're too broad, it's too difficult for somebody to understand the true tasks, and they probably haven't been identified. Uh, so I would see a, a you know more specific, but not down to the detail of the procedures. All right, and I always say one last question, and then someone else comes in with another one. <laughs> Very quickly, are there risks with this with regard to equal opportunity? So um, risks with this, and I'm not sure if we're talking about something in particular um, as far as what the risks are, but equal, the writing the job description and clearly delineating it is what happens um, is what protects you with equal opportunity. If you accurately reflect the business necessity and the job description, then that's what protects you when it comes to equal employment opportunity. 
So if you had more questions, unfortunately we are out of time, but we will have Karen address them directly um, and we will be able to follow up with you on some of the questions that you have. So I want to thank you guys so much for your questions and for attending today's webinar. As a reminder, please fill out the short survey we have because we really do appreciate your feedback. We'd also love your feedback online on LinkedIn, Google, or Facebook. Remember to tag us. And we hope you can join us for our next webinar on June 20th, which is about cybersecurity for the C-suite. You can sign up for our upcoming webinars on the Hausman Johnson website. And again, I want to thank you for attending and have a great rest of your morning.